Hi, I'm Krista Anderson. Some of you have joined me before. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist here in Indianapolis, Indiana. I practice under the name of Emozen, which is short for Emotional Zen. Thank you for joining me this evening. Um, I usually have guests on my podcast this evening, but this evening is going to be a little bit different. It's Black History Month, and I'm going to walk you on a journey with me um, about me understanding my own black history, which I do have, and um, how I have committed to become anti-racist, and I use that in my practice. I fully believe strongly that, especially Caucasian therapists, if we don't understand our own inherent racism, and stay with me, I know Caucasians, we Caucasians can get a little bit out of shape being called racist um, because we don't ever intend to be, but if we don't know our accurate history and if we don't do our work to become actively anti-racist, we do things that are racist by default, okay? So if you like this podcast, if you find it valuable, um, please uh, consider following me um, on TikTok at Krista Anderson 1221. I'm also on Instagram at Emozen Flow. I'm on Facebook at Emozen, an alternative and holistic mental health service. And my website is www.emozen.life. So if you get to those places and you really like what you see and you like what you hear on my podcast, because I am on all platforms, um, Apple, Spotify, um, there are others, but those are the ones that come to mind, but I'm on all of those uh, platforms for podcasts. If you wish to donate so that I can uh, produce these podcasts more often, feel free to do so at Venmo or Zelle, okay? And you can see at the bottom of the screen there how to do so with Venmo or Zelle. So um, that being said, I really am happy to be walking you on this journey with me this evening in honor of Black History Month. Um, I'm gonna bring to mind what it meant for me to understand how my inherent racism needed to be dismantled and give you um, stories and some pretty profound information about my own family's involvement in slavery during the Civil War. Um, so I'm gonna start with um, before I ever went to graduate school to become a family therapist, I was in the early 2000s and I took a serious interest in genealogy research. And when I did that, I found an excerpt from a great, 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 great grandfather's will that showed, and there you see it up on the screen. And you can see, um, I'm looking at this with you now, um, this is from 1862. Now, those of you that understand slavery, it was abolished. The amendment was passed in Congress on January 31st, 1865. Okay, so this was just a couple of years before slavery was abolished. But you can see all of those slaves, the it starts with Alfred and it ends with Priscilla. And I will mention each human being by name here in just a moment. But I want to tell you what I was doing when I actually read through this will. I was sitting at the desk in my home office and I got down to Artalisa, Artalissa actually. And by the way, I have a daughter named Alyssa spelled just like the end of Artalissa here. And um, Abraham, four and two. And they have prices after them just like all slaves did, and I'm gonna be substituting human being for the word slaves, but my children were the same age. And when I realized that my children, had I been African American, would have been sold for those prices that Artalissa and Abraham were sold, I literally dry heaved in the trash can next to me. And I, and I was very, very sad. Um, about the obvious involvement of my own family in owning slaves. And so I held this, I'm gonna keep this up because I want people to understand, and by the way, my ancestor's last name was Brown, 
And I want this to be up because, as we know, slaves had to take on the last name of their masters. And it's very hard for them to find, when, when people do their research uh, and they've been involved in slavery, it's hard for them to find familial connection, right? Because they took on their slave owner's name. So my great, 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 great grandfather's last name was Brown, for those of you that are watching and are interested. Um, but I held on to this, right? And I didn't know what to do with it. I knew I needed to do something uh, that was cathartic for me in dismantling my own family's inherent racism. And so when I got to grad school, I made contact with one of my most influential uh, friends and colleagues from grad school. Her name is Mother Catherine Weston. Um, she's an African-American woman. Um, and actually, she refers to herself as Nun Catherine Weston. I apologize. Nun Catherine Weston. She is an LMHC, and she has her own practice here in Indianapolis. Um, she received her Master of Arts in Pastoral Care and Counseling, and she is certified in EMDR, and she also does uh, neurofeedback. So uh, I just want you to be aware of her. Her, her practice is Weston Counseling. She gave me the inspiration to stand before a class and apologize on behalf of my family's involvement in the slavery movement in this country, okay? So what I wanna do today is do that again. I want to mention Alfred, who at the time was 40, Rhoda, who at the time was about 45, Nelson, and notice the yellow in parentheses about the epitome of racism right there, and I apologize for that. But he was about 23 years of age. Edmund, who was 21 at the time. Henry, about 21 also. Patsy, about 15 at the time. Perry, about 13. Martha, about 12. Fariba, about seven. Artelisa, about four. Abraham, about two. George, about 34. Nelson, about 36. Washington, about 23. And Priscilla, about 27. To all of you and your, and, and your um, children and family that has come after you, I want to extend a sincere apology on behalf of my family for being involved and being slave owners of human beings. I'm really, really glad to be dismantling my own inherent racism. And I had a conversation with my daughter the other day about what racism is because also um, Nun Weston, she and I were talking quite a few years ago. And I said to her, I'm not racist. And hello, Renee Michelle Merrifield. Thank you for noticing that we're talking about such an important topic. Not a problem. I am happy to be talking about it. And thank you for listening and anyone else who might tune in. But I remember when I said to her, and I'm not racist. And she said, pardon me. You know, I love you. But I find it offensive when you say I'm not racist. Because to say that means that you shut down any possibility that you might inherently be. And that really, really, really gave me pause to think, wow, that, that does shut things down. And that's the last thing I want to do when I'm speaking to people that I care about is making it seem like I am not open to feedback about change or understanding my own contribution to perpetuating racism. So at that moment, I realized I'm going to actively be anti-racist. And I have been that. And as a therapist, I, had, I alluded to this earlier, but as a Caucasian therapist especially, I really can't do a good job with my clients, um, my melanin-blessed clients, if I don't understand what they've been through in life. I'm gonna give you an example. Let me take a little drink of water here. Excuse me. About three years ago, and, and names and details are going to be changed for um, the sake of confidentiality. 
But I had a client come to me who was a victim of a brain blast. And this client's spouse was involved um, in law enforcement. So when this client came, the client was addressing the brain blast symptoms and trauma from war, post-traumatic stress from war. However, the things that caused this person the most trauma was when they returned from war is how they were treated in this country. How people, women would scoot closer to their, their husbands or hold their purse a little tighter. And this person said, it, you know, it's really traumatizing for me as I've been protecting this country and I come home and people act like they're afraid of me. And so we really didn't talk too much about the trauma of war. We talked more about the trauma of being black in this country. And had I not been doing my own work and understanding how important it is to be anti-racist, to understand the experience of black people in this country, I couldn't have been a big help. I would have been more injurious than helpful. And as we all know that our therapists and doctors, you take an oath to do no harm. So that's also why I've become very, very focused in taking care of my own and becoming more aware of my own racist tendencies. Um, so I, I had a really, another example too, when I was talking to my daughter, I had a um, conversation with her. She was saying, you know, well, you know, but we're not just inherently racist. I said, well, let me give you an example of what inherent racism is. It doesn't mean you actively are running around, you know, espousing your whiteness and trying to put people down. But this is something when I was, uh, six or seven and I had one of my African American sisters ask me when you were growing up before you became anti-racist did you ever was the n-word ever normalized for you so I am the progeny of a southern baptist preacher's a southern baptist preacher my family is from Kentucky so yes <laughs> that word is unfortunately normalized in that part of the world, or at least it was in my family uh, at that time when I was younger. And I don't know if you remember the rhyme, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger by its toe. Well, I wasn't taught it as eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger by its toe. I was taught it with the N word. And um, not until I was seven or eight was I promptly corrected by a teacher when I was playing on recess and we were, we were chanting that rhyme. And she said, oh, honey, we don't use that word. That is very disrespectful. And she explained to me why. And I remember crying and realizing I had no idea. That, my friends, is inherent racism. When we grow up thinking something is normal that has caused harm to so many people, you see still over my shoulder the list of the people that my own family enslaved. And this is why my dear friend and colleague and someone I look up to very much said to me, I find it offensive when you say I am not racist because it shuts down any conversation about the fact that you might potentially have some unconscious inherent racism prevalent in your life. So that, that really changed me. These experiences have really changed me. Now, when I got to graduate school, I've already mentioned the influence of Nun Weston. But other people that helped me open my mind were Nathaniel McGuire. I've had him on, on this show before. We've had some great conversations. A dear friend of mine, Shamira Aikens, is another person that has helped. Um, and Dr. Elect Starr and Dr. Sandra, Sandra Donaldson. Now, Dr. Donaldson and Shamira Aikens, they work at a place here in Indianapolis that is a phenomenally... Um, helpful and it's a wealth of resources um it's a place called um, family and community partners and family and community solutions you can find some great therapists there i'm mentioning them because i want to promote all of my phenomenal black colleagues um and dr elect star has a book out and i am embarrassed to say right now that i just forgot to pull it up so elect please forgive me. I will put a link under this podcast with your books to, to refer people to that. Nun Weston has one as well. I will put that up too. Um, but I think that it's crucial that I highlight why 
why it's so important and, and my black colleagues and friends have been so important to me in my life because, you know, the white supremacist part of this world, which we are all, we are all affected by, white people are as traumatized by slavery as black people have been. We really have been. Um, white rage is a big thing. Like you don't see black people raging. It's, they can't. You know, there's a reason for that. What happens if a black person rages? You know, we white mothers don't have to talk to their sons about, they don't have to have the hoodie conversation with their sons. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, they, we can, our, our sons can walk around the street pretty safe. Um, but if you have a black son, they sure not, they sure can't. So in any event, coming back around to why all of my black friends have been so important to me, I too have been traumatized in my life. And the people that have understood and been most supportive of me when I've been actively healing trauma have been my black friends. And I am so grateful from the depths of me for them understanding that and standing by me while they expect me to do my work. I, I want to thank all of you so much. Um, Andre Creighton is another uh, black friend of mine that I have been positively influenced by. He was a personal trainer that I worked with for a while, but I kind of get lazy sometimes with that. <laughs> In any event, side note, um, what I want you to be aware of too, if you are interested in dismantling your own inherent uh, racism or racist beliefs, racist attitudes, there is um, Rev Bridge Feltis. She has a website called rememberinstitute.com and she has a course for people that have been racialized as white. I took that course this time last year and every February I have, since taking that course, which this is the second year, I understand, but since taking that course, every February I do something to honor black history. And you can see up on the screen, she, her next course um, starts, wait, did that just say January 5th? I think it's, can you pull that back up, Jace? Jason, Jason, I'm sorry. It's, I think it's just automatically rotating. It's just automatically website, rotating. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, it is, I see. But she has a course coming up, if anybody is interested in taking her course. She's so well-versed. Um, she has so many uh, well-educated professors and people that are as committed to dismantling white supremacy as she is. I learned so much. It's a six-week immersive course, and I would happily, happily, recommend it take it take it take it take the course if you can um, because it is super helpful I will tell you that it is hard history because we have been um, mm, true history let's just say has been um, kept from us so if you take that course just be mindful that you're going to come become aware of things that are um, not so pleasant about why racism is such a big deal in, in this country. Um, but I just wanted to give kudos to Rev Bridge and the Remember Institute for doing the work that they do because when we've been racialized as white, and by the way, it's not just Caucasians that are racialized as white. Biracial people, Asians, um, you know, some Mexicans, they have been racialized as white too. And the privilege that comes with looking white or looking whiter is um, palpable in the, in the black community. And it needs to be addressed, it needs to be talked about, and we need to be the change that we want to see. And that's why I'm here telling my story of understanding my own, my own history with racism, my own family's involvement in owning slaves and being apologetic about that. I'm not a white apologist. I know it might sound counterintuitive because I just apologized, but the only way we can heal trauma is to acknowledge that it exists and stop gaslighting people for the trauma that they've experienced. Um, so I apologize again on behalf of my ancestors' involvement in 
the trauma that has been inflicted on black people in this culture. And it's not about not noticing color. It is about noticing and honoring the differences and loving each other anyway. So I just want to, again, out loud and big with big love, thank Rev Bridge Feltis and, and her staff. I want to thank nun Catherine Weston, Nathaniel McGuire, thank you and your beautiful family for supporting me. Thank you, Shamira, for being my friend. Thank you, Dr. Samuel Donaldson. Thank you, Dr. Elect Starr. And there are so many other people that have influenced my life. Those are the people that come up. Um, I also want to mention the positive influence Jayla French and Jordan Moore have had on my daughter. They're two of her best friends, and they are beautiful, strong black women. Um, I kind of want to be like them when I grow up my daughter too. <laughs> I, I, I joke about that, but I just want to say thank you so very much for the work that you do and the strength that you show because this work, this work is, uh, it's big, it's, it's deep, it's important and it's hard. Um, I want to add before I end up here. Hi, Brenna. Hey, thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to add, oops. I'm having those mic issues, Jason. I keep banging into that mic as I usually do. But I want to add that on um, 23andMe, uh, I, I did the research, pulled up the slave uh, excerpt from my ancestors' will, and have been distributing that to people that are interested um, in helping do their own genealogy research. But on 23andMe, I have found cousins now, I'm not going to mention their names because I don't know if they want to be mentioned. We've spoken briefly um, via the inbox in the 23andMe website. Um, and I asked them if they wanted to be on a podcast with me. Uh, maybe that's something that would come in the future. But my goal is to help reconnect families. Being a family therapist, me walking my talk, is dismantling my own trauma, being trauma-informed, being present for other people, and helping reconnect families, um, especially when my own family has been a catalyst in separating them. So I want to be an anchor and um, a trusted person and helping people reconnect to those they love and to their own family because family really does matter and there is no place more sacred or holy than where an ancient hurt has been healed and that's my goal of honoring my process and dismantling my inherent racism to become actively anti-racist and to be the change I want to see and um Thank you for your comments. Those of you that have been commenting, Renee and Brenna, I really appreciate that. I um, hope that this is helpful to even one person in finding some truth. Um, and remember the people that I mentioned that can also provide help and support. Thank you to all of you for uh, having enough emotional bandwidth to educate those of us that have been kind of snowed by the truth, by, by what has been taught as the truth that isn't really the truth. <laughs> so let me, let me make that very clear. Sorry for, for that misspeak. Um, thank you very much for, for bringing the truth to my attention so that I can pay it forward and bring the truth to those with whom I work. And thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And that's what I that's all I have to say in honoring my story and honoring my friends um, this Black History Month. And I hope it's been an inspiration to some of you. If you ever have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. Um, I mentioned that at the beginning of this segment. And I just wanted to say good night, have a blessed week, and again, be the change you want to see. Namaste. Thank you.